Thank you very much. Uh, this is my third year here. And uh, like every year, I hope what I have to share with you is, uh, of, is of use to you. You find it uh, relevant and, and interesting. Because I think there is a, a lot to talk about when we talk about psychology and performance, no matter what context of performance we're talking about. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I will talk about the psychology behind developing excellence in music. There are some key words here. One is psychology, obviously, is what I know about a little bit. Uh, developing, development is nowadays a key word that is more and more important in uh, performance environment. And I will talk about it a little bit. And excellence, because everybody who is in a performance context wants to achieve excellence. The key is how to get there. I will discuss a little bit, a little bit about that as well. Uh, as Archie said, I live now, it's been nearly eight years, I live in the Middle East. It's a very different part of the world. And uh, in the state of Qatar, and you can see in the map where Qatar is, it's a very small country obviously Muslim, Arabic, and uh, I've been working there in a place that looks like this in some places, and in other places it may look like Iraq, so it's a little bit uh, strange, but you do get used to it. Life is not as bad as some people think, it's actually all right, and I'm happy to be there, okay? So I work there in Qatar in a place called Aspire, Aspire Academy. It looks like uh, Disneyland somehow, especially if you like sport, it's, it's like Disneyland. And the Arabs are crazy about sport, and they're investing a lot of money in sport, and they're bringing experts from all over the world. And I've been uh, privileged and lucky enough to be hired eight years ago. Okay, so this is what I work. The relevance about this center is that they're trying to develop talent. They're trying to develop athletes. They don't have Olympic champions like we may have in the Western world, so they're trying to develop athletes, okay? But I was two weeks ago in Qatar. This morning, I was in my hometown. I was in Spain, okay? So this is what it looks like, southern Spain. It was quite hot, so I'm happy to be here now as well in Ireland, in Dublin. Um, in this presentation, just so you know what we're going to be talking about and you don't get lost, and if you do, you raise your hand and I will repeat myself. I would like to address three key issues that I think can be relevant to you. One of them is, as I said before, psychology in performance environment. Okay? Because we hear about it, but do we really know what it is? Second, talent development. These two words are very important. One is talent, the other one is development, versus talent identification which has been the biggest failure in sport, talent identification. I will dis, uh, discuss with you. And the million dollar question, who achieves excellence in music? We don't know much about it, but we know something. And I would like you to know what we know. And what we know comes most of it from sports psychology. And people ask me, you do what? What is sports psychology? Because we hear what it is. Most people don't know what we do. And it's our fault because we don't explain it. It seems a little bit hidden. And the problem with that is that now we have some gurus out there and they, they sell miracles. Oh, I'm going to do this and you're going to improve a lot in one month. And we're going to do this way, this new method. And we're going to do... I still haven't seen any miracles in any performance environment. I only see hard-working people. Those are the ones who excel. So what I believe is that mental training, as we see it in performance psychology, must be grounded in theory. What do we know? And research. How do we get that knowledge? And this, this, this is where I ground my knowledge and my experience. Everything else, I'd say, no miracles. And there are no quick fix solutions. You're not going to improve playing the piano 
overnight and tomorrow you're going to be between those top 10 pianists in the world. I don't believe that can ever happen. It's going to take time and a lot of quality work. We're in the era of technology and we do have all the technology we can imagine in Aspire Academy in Qatar. We have a laboratory that costs 200,000 US dollars. It measures everything in your brain and in your muscles. I can tell you it doesn't do miracles. It does not do miracles. The key to succeed in music, and we, we learn to know this in music as well, is, is somewhere else. And it's the human factor. For example, is the teacher. How good is your teacher? How well do you communicate with your teacher? I'm going to talk about this in a minute. But there are no programs there. There is no, OK, they can help you improving small aspects. You may look for a software to improve something related to tempo, for example, but it's not going to do miracles. I think, in my opinion, nothing will replace the human factor. And third, what I have learned, what I have learned is that only, only the guys, the people who work really, really hard and who already have some talent are the ones who will reach excellence. If you have nothing inside you and if you don't work hard, forget it. And I tell this to any elite athlete. I have no problem with that. Because again, miracles don't happen. Only work, work, work. So, first thing we will talk about is psychology in performance environment. We have a long history of learning, researching, and understanding sports psychology with athletes. And uh, in the last 10 years, there is some research emerging with pianists and with musicians. And what Richard, uh, research is telling us is that there are a lot of similarities. It is really, really similar what happens with pianists and guitarists and other musicians to what we knew in sport. For example, and this I said last year, I had not seen this quote. I already said that music is even more complex than sport. And I'm happy I found this quote in a peer-reviewed journal article. Performing in music is one of the most complex human performance tasks, incorporating complex cognitive and sensory motor skills. And it is true. You've chosen a difficult task, but it's exciting at the same time. Uh, peak performance is when performing at their best. They report, pianists in this case, and other musicians, they report high confidence, no fear of failure, they're in control of emotions, thoughts and arousal, highly energized and mentally relaxed. It, there's a lot, a lot happening here. This is exactly what happens with Olympic champions, for example, or with a Formula One driver who's risking his life at 340 kilometers per hour. Uh, you see, the quote is from 2014. It's very recent. It's very recent. Uh, when performance is not good, Poor performance is associated with self-doubt. We don't know exactly how to go about it. Feeling over or under aroused, loss of concentration and high stress. And this happens exactly in sport. So arousal is very important because it's linked to anxiety. Okay? So here in this figure, we see exactly as it happens in sport with musicians and with pianists. As performance goes up, we are a little bit more aroused. Because if we're not aroused, we're sleeping. And if we are too aroused, we're jumping up and down. We're too stressed, OK? So as performance goes up, arousal goes up. But you need to uh, regulate your arousal to an optimum level so it doesn't go too high, and then performance starts to decrease, OK? So everyone needs to find their optimum level of arousal, OK, which is how we are thinking and how tense we are, how we are feeling, all right? So this is exactly as it happens in sport. The difference is that we know these things. Most of these things we know from 1976 when they started researching and working with athletes in North America. Uh, that's why they say the uh, practitioners and, and uh, in academics, uh, they're thinking that w whatever we take for music, we should draw on findings from sports psychology. 
So, however, having said that, in 1976, they carried out the first study with pianists on stress. And they realized stress and anxiety was a problem, just like with athletes. But the next study was carried out in 1982, big gap, whereas in sports psychology, it kept on moving quite smoothly. But what happened now? Nowadays, we know that there are also some differences between sport and music. Don't, don't worry about this. I will highlight what you need to see, OK? Here, we have a comparison between team sport athletes, track and field athletes, and musicians. These are people who have achieved excellence, okay? People who have reached a high level of performance. Here we have some psychological characteristics that are, are necessary to achieve excellence. For example, commitment, coping with pressure, belief, exactly, or, and so forth. Now, if we look at imagery, we can see that in musicians, it's only used at around 50%. It's considered an, a skill that you can use 50%. It's not 100% relevant to what you're doing. Whereas track and field athletes, they may use it up to 75%. Team sports, 100%. This tells me, for example, that musicians could make use of imagery more often because we know very well from sport that we describe it as a functional equivalent between how we move our muscles and how we imagine our muscles moving. So it's good rehearsal. We could dedicate a whole day to discuss imagery. But I'm just telling you that it, this is something that we have found that is different in sport and in music. Another thing, very interestingly, and we will discuss a little bit later, is social skills. Those musicians who achieve excellence they think, or they tell us, that social skills are also important. Whereas in athletes, track and field, 37% of it. So this is not that relevant. I just have to run. But why do musicians and pianists say social skills are important? That's, I think it's a very interesting finding. We're going to discuss this in a minute, OK? Stage fright, music performance anxiety, all of you know, or most of you know, Again, it's very similar, uh, as, as we know it is in sport. Eh? Uh, this is just in a survey. They found that 2,212 classical musicians, 40% of those reported that anxiety interfered with their performance. Interfered. So there must be others who felt anxious, but they think still did not interfere, but they felt anxious. This is exactly what happens in sport. Now, A very recent study from just last year tells us that in pianists, the anxiety level during practice and rehearsal alone is lower, is higher when playing in a group of musicians, and is the highest playing solo. And this makes sense. You will say, of course, Jaime, this makes sense. In sport, it's the same. It's a little bit lower in team sports. It's a little bit higher in individual sports. And in those events, like gymnastics, where I, I find this very interesting, especially for what's coming in the next uh, slide. Where gymnasts are not evaluated by a stopwatch or a tape measure, they have a, a jury, they have officials. Then they feel the highest anxiety, which matches what you do when you perform piano. You're not racing against the stopwatch. There is somebody assessing you. It's a human thing, okay, it's subjective. So, Stage fright is a form of social anxiety. In sport, rarely you find this. You find this when the stadium is full of 100,000 people and you have to perform. But it's not usually the case. However, when you play the piano, in particular in solo, or when you're in front of an audience, you're going to feel anxiety. Not everyone, but many people. The, the problem with social anxiety is that we feel or we tend to feel a little bit uncomfortable when we need to be observed by others or when, even worse, I have to perform in front of, in front of others. 
And I'm sure if I ask you, how many of you have felt a little bit anxious before Christmas? Most of you would raise your hand. Because uh, if you didn't raise your hand, then you're really gifted. I call it the gift. You have no pressure. That's amazing. Or you don't care. I don't care. If I don't perform, I go home and I sleep. No worry. So what happens with social anxiety? And this is not exactly as we know it in sport. First, self-critical automatic thoughts. Automatic. It's very tricky. We don't realize, but it's happening. Oh, well, I'm not that well trained. I didn't perform yesterday, so, so today maybe it'll be not so good, blah, blah, blah. Fear of social evaluation. This audience is really good. That guy's a professor in that university. He's another one. Oh, they're going to be thinking that I'm not that good. These things happen, don't they? Don't you feel like this sometimes? A negative interpretation of the event. Okay, I've come here. This is really horrible. Why am I here? I should be at home. Why did I put myself in this situation? I really feel anxious, blah, blah, blah. So part of my job is to provide a solution. And as I said before, the solutions I provide is the ones that I know, based on research and practice, that they, they is what it works. And again, no miracles. Self-critical automatic thoughts. Everything that has to do with thinking has to do with the brain. How can I control my thinking? Self-talk strategies. Okay, I will show you in the next slide how that works. But self-talk strategies. Why? Because the fear, the, 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 the anxiety is never really going to go away. That, that's not going to happen. But we can manage. Eh? We can manage. We can put it aside and control it a little bit. We can do it by using self-talk strategies that I will show you in a moment. Fear of, of uh, social evaluation. Again, this is hard to come across in sport, but uh, from clinical psychology, which is the psychology of people who have mental problems, we know some people can't get out of home. They're afraid of being outdoors in the streets because they fear being observed by others. Musicians are not mentally ill, please don't get me wrong. But we have taken what we know from social anxiety, which is exposure. What does this mean? There are two ways to fight fear of social evaluation. And it depends on the person. A, you can take the, the biggest audience in the world, 5,000 people, really knowledgeable, all master, all, all teachers, excellent people in, in knowledgeable in piano, and you go there and you expose yourself and play. And then you'll see that you can still per perform. Another way to do it is more like progressive. So first, you rehearse at home. Then you call your best friends. They're sitting down watching you. You play in front of them. Then you get more people, perhaps some people who are friends of your friends who you don't know, and they're watching you. Then you play in front of a small audience. Then you play in front of a big audience. That's why, in a way, in a way, and it's not a social anxiety itself, but in sport, when coaches plan the competition calendar, they don't send them to the world championships straight away. They start in the local competition. And then they go to a bigger competition. And then they go to a bigger competition. That's how they do it. So in a way, exposing yourself to bigger and bigger and bigger audiences is a, is a better idea to fight Fight is not the right word. It's the wrong word, actually. You don't fight fear. You accept it. You expose yourself. You don't judge. You just perform. Okay? Very easy to say. It's very difficult to do. But exposure is the key. Okay? Negative interpretation of the event. We use reframing. There are two types of performers. The ones who achieve excellence and the ones who are below who never really achieve excellence. The difference sometimes is the winners, the winners see the uh, performance environment as a challenge. Uh, this is a challenge. I'm going to show what I can do. The not so good performers, they see it as a threat. This is going to be a little bit difficult. I'm not feeling well. I have pain in my back all of a sudden. What? This is the difference. So reframing means, hang on, you've not come here to be threatened by the audience. You've come here to show the audience what you can do because you've been rehearsing a lot and you're at that level. 
and here the teacher is a key player, okay? So self-talk, exposure, reframing. At the end of the day, what we want to do is increase the resources so that we can meet the demand. The demand is the audience, is the environment, is the performance environment. The resources is what I can do to overcome the demand. If my resources are below the demand of the situation, I'm going to be stressed. For example, if you play at home in front of your younger brother, of course, the resources are so high and the demand is so low. But it can be very different if you're somewhere else playing in front of a thousand people. Okay? So the key is to increase the resources. Okay? And a lot of it, it has to do with perception. This is a challenge. I'm here because I want to show what I can do. It's not a threat. Maybe he can see it as a threat, not me. And I see athletes before going to the track, before going to a final, and you ask him, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm going to show those guys what I can do. You can go. You're ready. While other people are in the toilet, having an awful time. OK? I hope uh, you can follow me. Can you follow me so far? Yes? Anybody getting bored? <laughs> so, no? OK. That's very good. So one thing we can do, because then you'll say to me, OK, yeah, but this, how do I do it? How do I do it? And this is my job, to tell people how you can do it. It doesn't always work, but it's what we have, it's what we know. There are two types of anxiety or stress, okay? One is in the head, what I'm thinking, the other one is in the body. It depends. Some people are thinking too much, too much, too much, they cannot concentrate anymore. Some people are too tensed and they cannot even breathe. They breathe with the upper part of the lungs. So we have two strategies, mainly. One strategy for cognitive is thinking, okay? It's information processing in the brain. Self-talk. If something goes wrong in my thinking, I need to think in a different way. As simple as that. So, keep it easy. Keep it easy, nice and simple. Before I jump on the stage, what do I need to really focus on to keep my brain focused on that thing that is relevant for me to perform? It can be start slow. Hey, this piece of music, we need to start slow. Remember? Slow. Okay, slow, slow. The brain cannot do two things. We cannot think two things at the time. I cannot be thinking slow and I'm afraid. So if I'm thinking I'm afraid, I'm done. If I'm thinking slow, slow, I'm still a little bit uh, anxious, but I'm controlling. I'm self-regulating. That's how we say when we manage Eh, to control ourselves in performance environments. We call it self-regulate. So, which plan word directs my attention to what I need now, right now? Okay, and I can imagine. I will do it like this, I will do it like that, I will start slow, slow, slow. Now, relax, relax, because we need to remember, calm, keep calm, and come on, let's do it. Why? Because this brings you this is you yourself, you give yourself a, a pat on the back because nobody's going to do it. Nobody will come to you 10 seconds before and say, good job, eh? come on, eh? good luck. No, you're on your own. So what do I need to do exactly? Relax, calm, and come on. Okay, okay, all right? Now, the breathing is going to be affected, okay, because it's linked to the how we feel, how we think. Uh, we just forget to breathe sometimes. We're not breathing properly. And sometimes people ask, how should I breathe? And I always say, just breathe. <laughs> just breathe. OK? Remember? OK? Because yes, if I'm not breathing, my muscles don't get enough oxygen, and then they'll be tense, and then it affects the coordination. We know that in sports very well. And I think, and I said it last year, to me, you're not athletes. You're super athletes. You are super athletes. Breathing and stretch. Some people stretch because, you know, forearms. If you feel that way. In sport, usually people work more on the cognitive side of it. Perhaps because they know their body so well. In music, I don't know because I haven't come across 10 journal articles. We don't know, maybe one, but we need more. 
right? knowledge. So, something to do with your head, something to do with your body. Any miracles? No. Little tricks? Yes. And don't do it on the spot. Don't come and do it before the audition because you'll be stressed. What did I do? What do I have to do? What did this guy tell me to do? You need to practice. First at home, then when you go to the first audition or the first... This needs training. Okay, mental training is training. Eh? Okay, so we discussed a little bit about performance environment, psychology, psychology versus sport. What do we know? What we don't know? What is relevant? What can we do? A few tricks that over time can help you. So far, so good? Everyone follow me? Yeah? Now, talent development versus talent identification. We have spent 30 years trying to detect talent. We still do nowadays. Some countries invest a lot of money. It doesn't work. We do it in Qatar. It doesn't work. We know in sport is very easy at the same time because you can see at youth level who gets medals. These guys. At the Olympics, who gets the medal? Different people. They're not the same. 90% of these kids who get medals in national championships when they are 18, 17, they don't make it to the Olympics. And you can check, you can ask uh, Carl Lewis, like I did, he said, I was nobody until I was 19. So today in sports science, in performance psychology, they have turned to development. They have turned to development because now they realize that, hang on, hang on. We're not going to find someone when he's six or seven or something. It's really difficult. It's just not going to happen. We need to look at the long development plan. And then there is the debate of nature versus nurture. One or the other. The answer, we don't know. A little bit of everything. You must have some innate fine attunement in your temporal lobe in the brain that helps you detect the pitch in music. Yes, you must have it. You must, there must be something. But a lot of things will have to do with development. And this is something that now we're looking more into. Predictability of snapshot uh, shots. You take uh, one of these auditions when you're five, six, seven. OK, this boy is going to make it. Oh, in 20 years, it's going to be incredible. Maybe not. We know nowadays that it has to do more with the family, with the parents, with how, with their knowledge, they guide them through the development with the teacher, the input of the teacher, than with the genetics. It's still not even clear. I was just reading in the plane uh, an, a journal article on uh, neuropsychology and how the temporal lobe detects this and that. We still don't know. It's really difficult. We still don't know which part of the brain is doing what. We used to think this is doing this, this is doing that. Now we know that there's more, there's more connections than ever before. And the brain adapts, adapts, because the, neuro, the, the neuro, uh, neural networks are fighting in different ways. And if you do it repeatedly, 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 the brain adapts. Eh? And that has been found with pianists. So development can be, oh, talent. Uh, the, realize, the realization of talent is a complex process and it is increasingly acknowledged that an array of factors, for example, environmental, social, psychological, contribute to the conversion of musical potential into high-level uh, performance. So this is more the way to go today. Uh, I'm going to explain this so that nobody gets bored, but I think this is one of the keys that I think that I have found uh, can explain talent. Talent, if you ask what's talent, everyone would say something different. We need to differentiate between gift, which is what we are born with, the natural abilities, and talent. Talent is now more seen as the outcome. Why? Because there are something inside each of us, hard work, attention, memory, uh, intelligence, uh, uh, commitment, uh, how your parents raise you at home, and family, the teacher, the school, how do that interact, what developmental processes take place, and then do you develop systematically skills? Yes, 
Then, after 10 years, then, it, okay, we can see some, some talent now. So now, the experts in the field are trying to wait and say, hang on, no, no talent, wait. Talent is when you're 20. Talent you can see when you're 19, when you're 22, when you're 18. The music is going to take longer because music is more complex and expertise in sport can be achieved when you train systematically for 10 years. In music, perhaps 20 years. So it's going to be a long way, a long road. Um, for me, I like to keep uh, things very simple. So when you leave this room today, you remember one thing or two. <laughs> but maybe it'll be enough. Because the difference, the difference between winning and losing is very small. Very small. And my job can be that very tiny bit. Nothing else. Everything else is work. Talent, for me, is quality work. And there is a lot in there. Quality work and time. Time, time, work, work, quality. The best teacher I can get. Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, next Olympic Games. What did they do? They brought Russian coaches. Where is the best pole vaulting coach in the world? In Russia. Let's bring him. Today, they have top pole vaulters already in two years. They're investing money, bring the best coach, good results. Before, never. Why? They didn't have the knowledge. So getting the right, <laughs> the right person to teach you is one of the keys, undoubtedly. Development can be very tricky because we have a mental representation. We're thinking, OK, I'm here, and I want to get there. Easy. It'll take some time. I'll work. Yes, I can do this. Eh? But, but what does development really look like? And we have some evidence already. We see, for example, a team player first appearance on a national team here, and then he goes down in performance. Track and field, injury, plateau going down. Musicians, entry to music college, entry to university, plateau. Hang on, what's going on? What's going on? I'm going to university, and, and then I slow down for one, two, three years. Maybe this is what research, research is telling us with with musicians. What happens, or what seems to happen, is that the challenges of each stage of development, though critical, appear less significant than the challenges associated with the transitions between stages. This, we knew it in sport. We know when you finish high school and you go to university, dropout is massive. But entry to music college seems to be. Why? Change of town change of environment. I don't see my friends anymore. New teachers. I have to study. A lot of musicians report lack of time for playing and practicing because I have to study more. So it is hard. Traveling, maybe financially constrained, is difficult. So this is what development really looks like. We need to be very careful. What are some of the psychological skills that musicians have found to try to make it over the transition period to college that we know. If we look at here, dedication and determination, so be really, really dedicated and determined. I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep on rehearsing, and I will study no matter what it takes. Adaptability and learning from the environment, a new environment. Adapting is very important. And realistic evaluations. This is something that it comes over and over in the literature. This means, am I that good? Is my tempo that good? Is my left hand that good? Is it really? Because the best pianists in the world have told us through research that they are better at taking criticisms to learn, to get to where they want to get in general. There may be someone who would say, I don't care what you say. But as a whole, they take feedback in a way that they use it, OK, I'm going to improve myself. So realistic evaluations are very important. Another critical period in the development of a pianist is entry into music profession. So I finish university. Now what? OK, I have a chance to be 
full-time musician, great, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to improve. Actually not. It's, it's tricky. It's tricky. It's another change in your life. Every time there is change, it's going to be tricky. What are the skills that they're telling us that help them to survive or to improve and to make themselves better? Self-belief, determination, social skills, ability to get on with others, social skills, to excel in piano, adaptability, coping skills, realistic evaluations. Social skills have been, have, uh, been found. And now I'm going to say something that is uh, very important to you, especially if you've come from abroad. Being here, being here, and coming to a master class and watching yourself, someone of your similar level of performance, playing, getting feedback, is of huge value to you because you have similar level of performance. This is part of social skills, vicarious experience, how I learn from someone who can perform at my same level because I'm listening and I'm learning. Social skills start when you're a child. I'll give you an example. How we, we will cope with stress when we are adults is strongly related to how we as children saw our parents dealing with stress. So if my father and my mother don't worry, it's going to be all right, it's going to be okay. Look, we're going to deal with this, don't worry. I'm learning through long time how to deal with stress. We know that. So that's part of social skills. Who's going to teach you how to play piano? Your teacher when you're a kid and then when you're a teenager. The teacher, the way I see it, is the most important person in your career. When you're a father and a mother, of course. You want a, your child to be a pianist? Of course, a musician? Great. But there is a point in time, teenage years, where the teacher, and this, this is strongly uh, robust in the, in the sports psychology literature with athletes, the coach is the most important person for an athlete. And in music, there is still little evidence, but there is some evidence telling us that the teacher is the key to succeed. There is no software. Forget about machines, forget that you get the right teacher, the one who can get the most of you. And if you need to change to another teacher to improve another aspect, you need to do it. And getting out of your house and coming here and watching others being trained and being exposed to different teachers is doing the right thing. And I'm not saying it, it's the research. Okay? So if you have any doubts in mind, why did I come to Dublin for this? There is a lot of value in it. So, that is about talent and that is about development, so that we understand. Eh? Because sometimes we think, oh, you know, I was not born with that talent. I don't agree anymore. You need to think, what can I do to develop talent? This is the difference. Huh? So, who achieves excellence in music? And as I said before, we don't know. We know very little. But then maybe this little can be of some help. This is a little bit radical, eh? Success, failure, eh? There is something in between as well, eh? Okay? Uh, but this is just to, to present the topic. What is clear, and in, in piano as well, pianists, is that experts are exceptional, motivated individuals who take advantage of environmental factors that are associated with skill development. We're thinking always about how can I improve? Yes, skill development. But that how is the environment. We need to be clever as well. How to utilize, how to use the environment. And that is the coach. That is the music school. That is the city I go to. From performance psychology, typically this is roughly what can be done. It's the, what we call the psychological skills training. Eh? Roughly. Okay, so there is an assessment. Okay, where are you at? Uh, we set goals, what do you want to achieve? And then there is a package, self-talk, attention, motivation, arousal, regulation. This is pretty much by default. This has been done for 30 years. And then self-confidence, because self-confidence is, is a relevant variable before the stage. Today, today we know more. Today we know more. Today we know goal setting and 
self-confidence are crucial. Crucial. Question. Do you know what you want to achieve? Yes, I know, I want to be a good pianist. That doesn't say anything. What exactly is it that you really want to achieve? Do you know how specific it is? I want to be top 10 in the world. Measurable. How am I going to measure it? I'm going to get these critics to talk very highly about me. I'm going to be with the best teachers. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. I'm going to know exactly every six months where I am at so that I can see my progress. Action-oriented. What do I need to do, to, to do? I need to go to Dublin. Next week, I need to go to Germany. I need to change teachers or I need to stay with my teacher. Realistic. How far can I really get? Because a lot of people get frustrated in the way. Maybe we need to also sit down with the teacher and say, hey, really, where do we want to be in four years' time? I said last year that the best coaches I have ever worked with are the ones who lay out a four-year plan for the athlete. Four-year plan? You're crazy? They do it, and they're very precise. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Because there, are the, there is the Olympic cycle every four years, Olympics, and then... Of course, injury happens and things, but they're really accurate. Timely, when? Next month, six months, one year, five years? What do I want to look like when I'm 30? I'm more than 30, by the way. <laughs> anyway, I'm self-determined. The teacher can guide you, especially when you're now more than an adolescent, you're, you're, you're in your 20s, but you need to be able to say, hang on, but I also want this. Your, your teacher can assist you, but you, you, need to, you need to have that inside you. You, you, need to be, you need to be a tiger somehow. Hey, I want more, okay? Eh? You cannot just be, uh, let's, let's see what happens. So we call it SMART goals, because you, you can't remember, but it'd be, it, it's, it's good to sit down with the, with the teacher and say, hang on, what are we doing? Where do I want to be? Where do I want to be in two years' time? because the, the pathway is going to be so long, I, at least I want to have landmarks. That is goal setting. Very important nowadays. The other one is self-confidence. Self-confidence, I mean, if you go on the stage and you are calm and you're not overconfident, that's tricky, or underconfident, but if you're confident enough, then I'm going to sit down, I'm going to play, I'm going to show what I can do. <sighs> Let's see. Okay, it, that's excellent is the most important psychological variable before coming on the stage. Confidence, okay? So this is pretty much sports psychology training, mental training, right? So just so you have a, an idea. But we know more. We know a little bit more, and it gets more interesting. We know there are at least three things that the top musicians just like the top athletes do very well. And the others, they don't do it that well. The first one is goal-directed behavior and commitment. Goal-directed is whatever you do, you do it for a purpose. Nothing is random. I'm going to go to Dublin and see what happens. That's not the right approach. I'm going to go to Dublin and I'm going to ask somebody how can I improve this if I have the chance. You need to be goal-oriented, always for a purpose, without becoming obsessed. But experts are the ones who develop this skill and commitment, obviously. Second thing, engage or engagement in problem-focused coping behaviors. Problem-focused means I have a problem. My foot does not go well in the piano, and I need to improve that, for example. What can I do? What do I need to do? How can I do it? Who do I go to? When? Let's go to this teacher. He's in London. I'm going to go there one month, one week. I'm going to pay if I can, or I'm going to go to this festival, or I'm going to do... But this needs to be resolved by three weeks' time, three months' time. needs to be done. Problem, focus, coping, behavior. Coping, because when you know what you need to improve, and you... Tackle it, 
just the fact that you're engaged, involved in that process, makes the uncertainty go down. Because if you come here and your foot is not good enough on the pedal, it's going to create uncertainty because you don't know how that's going to be. But doing something to prevent this makes you feel more comfortable. Hey, hang on. I'm working for it. I'll come back. Okay? Clear? And something else. The third thing. If you can remember one, I'm happy <laughs> at the end. Uh, social support seeking and then learning from feedback. Social support seeking. This is what I said before. I, wait a minute. I play the piano, my friend. I'm in my room. I'm really, really good. I see my teacher. That's it. Well, actually, most of the people who achieve excellence, they don't do it that way. They get out. They get out. They look for sources of information. How can I improve? What do I need to do? Where do I move next? And learning from feedback. Nobody likes to hear that ah, this is wrong. Uh, this is not the way. Ah, hang on, wait, why don't you change this? And then you may be thinking, I'm doing it very well. What is he talking about? Okay, if it's the right teacher, hold on. I'm going to listen. I'm going to try. It's going to take time. But we know there is a better chance to achieve a higher level if you follow these steps. How do we know? Because researchers have spoken, they have interviewed top pianists, and they have said, I did this, I did that, I was very good at that, I did that. They have gathered all the information and they have said, hang on, there are common things here, these guys can do this, they can do this, and they can do this. Hey, this information, this is gold. This is gold. All right? I had the opportunity to talk to, you probably don't know, but... Her name is Nadia Comaneci. She's the first gymnast who got a number 10, a 10 score in 1976. And I spoke with her and I said, Nadia, how did you manage to get those women, in the, the, the jury, the officials, to give you a 10? She said, I worked. I worked my ass off. <laughs> and then when I got to the, uh, to the Olympics, I did what I was doing every day. So she, just, she was working. And if you hear people talking about her, oh, she had this she had super talent, this and that. Or she said, I worked a lot, five hours. <laughs> I, was, I was killing myself. That, that's talent. Okay? So this, we know, predict success as a whole. As a whole. Don't take it as a rule of thumb. Eh? As a whole. So, just to wrap up, eh? uh, and then we can ask questions and we can discuss. Eh? There is a lot to talk about if you want. Eh? We have discussed psychology in performance environments, okay? Uh, what is it, what we do, sport, music, what we know, a little bit of key things like uh, stage fright. Why development? Uh, what is talent, really? What we think, <laughs> maybe in five years' time, somebody will say, no, hang on, now there is something else. What we think talent is today, and why development is important. And I, th I think it's a good thing because it gives you hope. It gives you hope. It's not all about, I was really good when I was seven. Hang on. Maybe when you were seven, you were not amazing. But you've got the right environment, the right attitude, and the right goals. And maybe you can develop as a talent. And some tips on things we know that experts tell us that help them to achieve excellence. And that is different from what others who don't achieve excellence do. All right? As simple as that. Okay? So, what we can do now? What we can do? You say, okay, you've been talking about this, talking about that, I'm getting bored, blah, blah, blah. What we can do? Look, my recommendation, very simple. Set goals. Know where you're going. Commit. No matter what. Commit. Seek problem-focused solutions. Don't wait forever. It's not going to happen. You need to get out there and find the solution. Rash rationalize your fears. Fear is going to be there. Hang on. I'm going to expose myself. I can do it. I'm prepared. I'm going to rehearse. I'm going to work. I'm going to be ready for it. Okay? If this is not a threat. This can be a challenge, and I'm going to show what I can do. Work very, very hard. Perhaps the most important thing. Work, work, work. 
in the end you you get uh, you 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 improve if you work and uh, enhance your confidence because it's the last thing that we know that is, is relevant just before sitting there okay not overconfident that's tricky not underconfident and sometimes we forget the most basic thing is it's lovely it's beautiful to play the piano eh? don't forget eh? so thank you very much thank you very much and i'm taking any questions If anybody would like to ask anything, or if anything is not clear, I'll be happy to. If anybody got bored, Frank. <laughs> um, I'm surprised, had surprised, that the imagery is so low for musicians. Um, what occurs in coaching in the other teams where they are so high? How do the coaches make that happen? That musicians and teachers. You know what, Frank? I think it's part of the sports culture. It's part of the sports culture. Uh, before a high jumper is going to high jump, we've seen that in TV many times. We've seen them closing their eyes, maybe, and imagining how they're going to. And this this gets to people's heads, to people's heads. And then the coaches know it's important because the coaches are. And I think th there should be more of this in piano as well. The coaches are obsessed with motor control, motor learning, motor performance, more than the brain. Uh, and we know, we know that the top athletes, if you plug them, and I do it, you plug them to an electromyogram, which tells you the muscle activity, even if you're not moving the arm, you have a javelin thrower, you plug, you, okay, you put some sensors on his arm, and then he's not moving the arm. But you tell him, can you please imagine yourself throwing? And then you have a screen with a dot moving, and then when he's imagining the movement, the graph moves up and down. If you take a 14-year-old javelin thrower who's learning, and you do the same experiment, the graph barely moves. We know that when you imagine a movement, you can imagine it, okay, there are different ways, okay, some people can imagine better than others. Uh, it's a skill that can be developed as well. When you imagine the motor pattern is exactly the same as if you were moving. So it's some sort of training in a way. It's not a substitute of motor training. It cannot be a substitute of playing the piano, but we know 10, 15 minutes in bed, before you go to sleep, unless you're too tired, you lie down in bed, you practice yourself parts of your piano rehearsing or something, we know over a period of time is going to enhance the functional equivalent between reproducing the movement and imagining the movement. We know, and that is scientific. Why is not used in music so much? I think it's just not part of the culture. They have focused on other things. But this is my opinion. I could be wrong. But would you like to ask anything? Uh, every, every, every question, I'm sure it's very, very, very relevant. I can tell you that for sure. Yes. Uh, so this is a topic I'm actually not very familiar with, so I can't be very specific. But I heard, um, I guess, I don't know if the but you talk, you're talking about being into the zone, and you hear about these like high performance states of mind, and you hear not just in sports, but in music and writers, you know, mm -hmm. when you're just inspired. And mm -hmm. It seems like um, the kind of thing that, uh, at least I feel like in the musical world, that kind of happens when the stars align. But in the sports world, it seems like they talk about it as if it's a reliable thing that they have like a routine to get, you know, athletes into this kind of zone. <laughs> You've asked a very important question. You see? You see what I was saying before? This year, I carried out a study on flow with athletes in Qatar in collaboration with Liverpool Hope University. 
I was just on a Skype conference last night with a professor in Liverpool. Flow. What is flow? Flow is something that we still don't understand very well. It's something new, as you say. You know a lot now. Eh? You know more than you think you do. Uh, and it's something that athletes describe consistently. And it is this. They describe after a world record or a best performance, they described it as if things were happening with no effort, effortless, uh, in harmony, uh, in slow motion, and uh, in a state of uh, just flowing. That's how they describe it. And sometimes we have tested that because after a world record, someone has asked uh, the athlete, what happened? How do you do it? And they say to you, I don't know what happened. I don't know. And uh, we don't know how or why it happens. There is maybe a couple of papers addressing that in music, and it does happen as well to a certain extent. So it's when things come easy, uh, effortless, you're in the zone almost. It's like you're flowing, everything is easy, confident, relaxed. I don't know where, it, where it's coming from, but it is happening. We don't know why it happens. But it happens to the top athletes and to the top performance, performers. What we are working on, which is the work I've been doing this year, is how to get there. How to get there, okay? And the starting point we know is to set goals, is to know what you want to do. Because when the frontal lobe of uh, your brain, which is responsible for planning behavior, knows what you want to achieve, everything else seems to be better integrated. You kind of follow your thinking, your planning better. Um, another part is imagery. Those uh, performers who can imagine themselves performing on the piano, and they can do it in actual real speed, or they can do it in slow motion, and they can do it faster. They can do it with a big audience, imagining playing in a big audience, or solo. They have that ability, and uh, that seems to induce them in a state of flow. And the third thing is, we call it technically, unambiguous feedback, which means you know exactly what is happening on the piano. You know you're doing a good job. If you're not sure, am I doing it right? Is this sound, is, am I doing it right? Then it's difficult to get in the flow state. So we know three things. Setting goals, imagery, and unambiguous feedback. Uh, I have had, just an example, I have had athletes who, uh, who, after their performance, have come to me afraid, saying, I don't know what happened, but I was running in slow motion, and I did personal best. And I said, hang on, hang on. And I can tell you, these are the guys who the coach says he's going to be an Olympic finalist. So there is something, but we don't know what it is. And there is some evidence that it happens to musicians as well but we don't even less in music, okay? This is a uh, flowing, a uh, state of flow. It's very interesting, it's very interesting. As I said, just this year I was in involved in that kind of uh, topic. So, do you think it's, I guess it's more associated with um, kind of a, a more stable development of, your, of yourself and like um, your level of preparation rather than some kind of pre-performance routine that people go through? Um, do you think it's more, after like years of preparation, you're at a level where you have a chance of getting into the kind of flow. It's not really like athletes like that like go through mm. like some kind of routine beforehand to actually yeah. get into it. No one actually tries to do that. You're a sports psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> you're telling me the right things. I think, I'm speculating now, okay, but I think flowing takes place because, as you say, you've been working quality work for so long so well, and you've tried to put things together, and everything has been automatized in the brain, that flow happens because everything kicks in, everything is integrated perfectly. Then you're flowing. Very good, eh? <laughs> very good. As I said, every question is very relevant. We, we've seen this last year, and, and, and the, the, really, because we can talk about many things. Anyone has any? any? It's also that confidence has to do with getting in that flow. 
uh, once you are confident you can do something. Um, for some people that gets in the way, they, they suddenly lose that confidence even if they have the skill. Again, I'm, go I'm going to speculate, but uh, what makes sense is that confidence has not been associated to flow in research because perhaps they've looked at other things first and confidence will be the next thing to look at. But for sure, when you feel confident, you feel comfortable, we, we call it, in, in sports psychology, we, we call it composure. We feel in a state of composure. We feel we feel we are ready to, to, to go on stage. So confidence, I'm sure, it, it is also is, is also relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Co confidence is the most important variable before the performance. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Linford Christie, a British sprinter. He said, he said once, he said, when I'm in the call room waiting to jump on the track, if one other athlete looks at me, I look at him with a killer face like this, because if his look is more frightening than mine, he will beat me. He will ruin my confidence. This was uh, the Linford Christie, who's two, two something meters, a big guy, you know, I, was, I wouldn't look at him like <laughs> anywhere like that, but so it, it, it's important. Confidence is important, but, but, but one key aspect when we talk about confidence is what are the sources of confidence? Okay, because you can say to me, I'm really confident, but we know the first, the, the most important source of confidence is a successful previous performance. If you know you did it already and you did it very well, this is the most important thing, okay? So that's why one of the strategies to enhance confidence is to remember that you've done it before. And with these uh, football players from Barcelona, and they watch videos of themselves winning the Champions League three years ago, before the final this year, for example. We know they do those things. Because then in your brain, memory comes, emotions come, thinking, ah, I did it that way, aha, I did it like this, Ooh, I can do it, I've done it. It refreshes yourself. Because confidence has to be real. You cannot lie. You cannot lie. And this is why the teacher is very important. The teacher needs to be able to say, look, the pedal will go wrong. Everything else, do it the best you can because you can do really good. And then it's realistic confidence. And then you know. Uncertainty goes down because you know what to expect. And then you are a little bit more confident. Arousal is more optimum. Anxiety goes down a little bit more. Everything is like balancing up. And then hopefully then you flow. So everything is interconnected. Uh, nothing is fully isolated in, in psychology. Very interesting questions. Yeah. Any, anyone has any, any question? Any other thing that you would like to ask? Uh, and if I don't know the answer, I'll say I don't know. <laughs> Simple as that, Frank. Yeah. There's a bit of research regarding <laughs> the senses and performance and how they would relate specifically. As a musician, you know, we don't have to worry about the taste. You know. mm -hmm. We do have listening, we do have tactile, and of course we do have the vision, either if we're reading mm -hmm. the music or we see the notes, the landscape of the keyboard as we're playing. Has there been any research regarding the issue of integration of those skills as it might pertain to the Because I can't imagine any other sport that does what we do with the specific the, the sensory. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, just, I mean, it's gymnastic, I mean, it, it's muscular, it's psychological, mm -hmm. but I don't know if, if, if we could account for the spontaneous uh, animation as we play of mm -hmm. adjusting on the spot due mm -hmm. to what we perceive in our senses. Mm -hmm. Has there been? Yes, yes, there has been. Uh, and again, mostly, if not everything, in sports. And it has to do with imagery. When we work on imagery, sometimes, and it can happen when you're performing in piano, we mistakenly call it visualization. Okay? Because when you say visualization, you're restricting yourself to what you can see. Okay, 
through the eyes, we get about 70% of the information from the environment. It's very important. But when we imagine, we can do it with all the senses. For example, in swimming, imagery, the smell is very important because they need to recall the smell of the chlorine. That brings them to the swimming pool, nearly for real. So in piano, the senses, OK, tactile is important for sure. Visualizing how you play is important, but perhaps there are certain rooms that smell like wood or audiences where there is a particular smell that experienced pianists can recall better because they've been there before. So it, when we imagine, we should imagine with as many senses as possible because that is closer to the real experience. This is uh, what we know. Anyone else? <laughs> Are you tired? You're tired? It's been a long day eh? for you guys playing and uh, coming and going and uh, eating and coming back. And uh, So there are no more questions, Rona, then? One? Ah, OK, my friend, the sports psychologist. <laughs> my friend. <laughs> I was kind of thinking throughout this presentation is that um, one of the difficulties of being a musician, perhaps more than being um, an athlete, is that I feel like for musicians we are involved with a lot of self-coaching. Um, I think our professors, they guide us, but they're not nearly mm -hmm. as, they don't program. They get noticed if don't give us a program like you would, I feel like mm -hmm. as an athlete. So I'm not sure because I've been pretty athletic. Um, so I guess I was wondering, um, whether you could talk a little bit about excellence in coaching and then, you know, and then uh, perhaps having us take some tips in terms of how to coach yourself, mm -hmm. in terms of programming, in terms of um, setting long term goals, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, that might be a difference between music and sport. In sport, self coaching is not really contemplated, unless you're 35 and you're close to retirement and then. You're not going to be coached by anyone. So what we look at is at what we call the motivational climate. And this is very relevant nowadays in sports psychology. Motivational climate is the relationship between the athlete and the coach. And I'm sure this is very similar between the pianist and the teacher. There are two styles in this motivational climate that is sort of like imposed in a way by the coach. One is uh, result-oriented, outcome-oriented. The other one is process-oriented. So we know, OK, result-oriented is the coach who is telling you to train every day because he wants a medal tomorrow. And you train hard, 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 without respecting resting, uh, recovery cycles, or you know holidays when you need a break, for example, and then you get burnt out, injured, whatever. I'm sure it can happen in, in, in piano somehow. Uh, and the other coach is the one who would be looking for the process of learning. The process of learning is that when you get here, let's transfer it to, to piano. The goal is to learn. Practice, learn. Practice, learn. And we know with a lot of evidence that it's the, the second one is the process-oriented uh, motivational climate is the one that leads to success. That's the one that fosters development. Why? Because when you're learning, you're getting intrinsically motivated. Hey, I'm learning a new skill. How cool, I can play this. I couldn't do it the other day. Now I'm, I'm learning. Hey, that drives your energy, your commitment. I want to keep on improving. I want to keep on going. You don't get burnt out that easily. You don't get tired or fed up. You don't get so stressed because you're not waiting for an outcome tomorrow. So we know in, this, in the sport domain, this leads to better outcome in the long run. That is for sure. In music, I have not come across any information regarding the motivational climate or the relationship teacher uh, a pianist or a musician. There might be something, but I haven't come across it. But in sport, it's very clear. And I think if you're developing in music, the process should be similar. 
should be focused on learning because the, the road is going to be very long and you're going to have to learn a lot. The outcome will come. Okay, you need to expose yourself to certain type of, of comp competitive environment. You need to be you know, exposed to, because you need to also learn to cope with, with the pressure. But the goal should be learning. Yeah? It fosters motivation, your attention gets enhanced because you know what to focus your attention to, to the key relevant aspect of learning the skill. Because you need to learn the skill. You can win the audition, but have you learned? You know what I mean? How if the level of the audition was low? You win, but have you learned? So this, this uh, about self-coaching or self-teaching as a musician, what I can link it is to what experts, musicians have told us already, is that the, the social support, what comes from the teacher is very important. The family background is very important. Seeking, learning from others, feedback, and this to me has to do more with an external human being, if you like, than with myself. But again, this, I'm again speculating. I like to be objective uh, in what I know and what I don't know. But sometimes things kind of make sense. Uh, but again, another good question. Are we tired? We, we stop? Or yes? Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Eh? Thank you. Tomorrow, yes. Tomorrow we'll do something different. Tomorrow is a practical session. It's something that uh, we've done before with pianists. And uh, it's not about me. Tomorrow is not about me. It's about you. Because in the end, the, and this is something else we are learning in development, it's more about the musician. It's not so much about the others. The focus is on you. But tomorrow we will we'll do. Some of you did it last year. Chloe, you were here with us last year, for example. Well, you were here, yeah? You, you were here last year when we did the. You did not do that? Ah, the year before, two years ago. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Then you did something different. You did something different. Tomorrow, it'll be different. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rona. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank mm -hmm. you.